والصلاة والسلام على الشيخ الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبشرح لي صدري يسر أمري وحل العقدة من لسان فهو قولي اللهم انفعنا بمعلمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين Respected brothers and elders and sisters in Islam As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Who by his fadl and grace We do not do anything in ourselves Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who does everything Allah by his blessing has entered us in the month of Ramadan It is such a wonderful experience Alhamdulillah We have relatively like 50 minutes before the first fast is over Now subhanallah you think about it now We're talking about first Ramadan We're going to reach the 30th or 29th very quickly Time flies by very quickly subhanallah Let's take advantage of our time, inshallah ta'ala. Allah will allow us to benefit tremendously from this month. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Along with our recitation of the Quran, dhikr and ibadah, one of the goals of Ramadan is that we can also sit and understand the Quran as well. And this is something which we should always do with a teacher because many times we may understand something, it may be correct or incorrect. And so it's important that we go through the proper method, which is the chain that goes back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so we learn from the mashayikh, our scholars, who learn from their teachers, who learn from their teachers, who go back to the tabi'een, who go back to the sahaba, who goes back to the Prophet And so that's why we made these small little sessions in Ramadan to hopefully complete that goal of maybe giving a little bit of our day to understand the Qur'an. That's why we only keep it like roughly 20 minutes max because everyone has their ibadah to do. And I don't want to interfere with anyone's khatam of the Qur'an and things like that. You know, people are trying to hit big major goals. One guy's trying to do 10 khatams, another guy's trying to do 15 khatams. SubhanAllah. Allah accept everyone's efforts, inshallah. And may Allah give us that type of himma too. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. The surah that we decided to choose for this tafsir session is uh, Surah Al-Ahzab. The reason is because, mashallah, we've been covering uh, various surahs throughout. It's my, I think, my sixth year now, I think. I think. Something. And uh, we've been covering, alhamdulillah, the du'as of the Qur'an we did in one year. We also covered uh, the stories of the Qur'an in another year. Another time, we also covered the famous surahs like Yasin, Mulk, um, Waqi'a, etc., Surah Al-Rahman. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us blessing after blessing to continue to explain the Quran to people, alhamdulillah. And this year I want to just pick a surah which is very close, near and dear to my heart, which is Surah Al-Ahzab. It is a remarkable surah. I'm telling you, in terms of surahs in the Quran, this one just starts to shine like no other surah really shines. It is a surah that has about 73 ayat. So we have to cover about maybe three ayats per day. You're going to see the challenge as soon as we start about how deep the surah is. Okay. Um, but it's a surah with 73 ayat. It's a short surah. You know, you would tell yourself. But it has, for example, I'll give you the topics. I wrote down most of them, like one page. It has topics about adoption, divorce, marital life, Zayd radiyanu, Zainab radiyanha, the Prophet and his honor, the uh, a critical ayat about hijab, the, uh, the woman's issues and, and rights, societal issues, the mother of the believers, Khatm al nubuwa the prophethood, the Prophet and being the final prophet. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. And this is on Surat al-Ahzab. Ahzab is one of the wars that occurred in the life of the Prophet it's a surah that combines. Oh. I thought all shaitans were locked up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the surah which combines uh, a number of various topics together, subhanAllah. And so it's again like it's this jamir, comprehensive, amazing gem in the Quran. And I've always wanted to sit down and discuss it with everyone because I, I wish we could really just appreciate and value the lessons Allah that gives us in the surah. So I may do for myself, inshallah, first and foremost, that I can benefit. And may God for everyone, inshallah, allow us all to benefit, inshallah. The su every surah has a theme. And because surahs are very wondrous in that way, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about so many things, like a khatib who come on the minbar. He mentioned like 15 different things. You're like, man, all this stuff he mentioned. But there was one thing he was talking about, which all unifies to. For example, one khatib will come to speak about this story and this story and this lesson and this lesson. And his whole goal is to talk about taqwa, right? So Allah ta'ala, in the same way in a surah, Allah will talk about multiple things discuss so many issues but there's one important theme that Allah wants us to remember what is the theme and, and the importance of Surah Al-Ahzab Surah Al-Ahzab's theme according to Imam uh, Biqa'i Rahmatullahi he said that it is to have ikhlas al-ikhlas ila Allah ta'ala min ghayr mura'atin lil makhluq he says that it is to have ikhlas sincerity towards Allah it's not me is it so I know yeah, maybe we can just. It is to have a sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's like looking out. 
It's a pneumatic system too. This one's a little easier too. Zakah. It is to have ikhlas sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without paying attention to creation. And this is the thing when a person says they're sincere before Allah. So I don't know. I don't know which one it is. I'll just keep on both, inshallah. So if one fails, the other one can happen, you know. It's like having two wives, you know. So, alhamdulillah. Please, uh, these sessions are very uh, uh, informal and just kind of like, alhamdulillah, you know. We don't want to make it so serious, but at the same time, we're going to learn some serious lessons. So again, the, the surah's goal, is, mashallah, is to show us the sincerity towards Allah without consider, considering what culture says, what society says, what makhluk says. That's when a person truly is a worshiper of Allah and not a worshiper of their feelings, not a worshiper of people, not a worshiper of their culture. Because unfortunately, we all suffer from this disease. And the surah is such an amazing surah from the beginning to end. And so again, we'll show you, inshallah ta'ala. And I hope that, inshallah, we're, I'm hoping to hit ayah number three. I think we're probably going to finish one, okay? It depends on the depth of it. I always want to show you all. If you want to know what a surah is talking about, if you want to know what a surah is talking about, just explore the first ayah of the surah. It will give you a good enough overview of what the surah is going to discuss. The surah opens up by saying, Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is how the surah begins, saying, Ya ayyuhan nabi, O, o, nabi, o Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so when you hear that, immediately when you hear Ya, it is a call in Arabic for somebody. When you hear, Ya Yuhan Nabi, what happened in your hearts? When Allah says, Ya Yuhan Ladina Amanu, Allah is saying, all those who believe, right? So all believers there, right? And Allah has a lot to tell us. We have to learn about halal, we have to learn about haram, we have to learn about what's right, what's wrong. When Allah says, Ya Yuhan Nabi, what do you think? What does the Prophet I need to hear? <laughs> you know, like, subhanAllah. That's the first thing that comes to my mind, is that what does the Prophet I need to hear? And it's such an important thing. It must be super important. If Allah is revealing the Quran to his Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi saying, Oh, Prophet, there's something I have to tell you. Then this captures the mind and the heart of the reader immediately. And that's what happens when you grasp the Arabic. So Allah does starts off saying, Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't say his name though. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah ta will mention the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by name. And so this is one of the honors of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. First and foremost, we have to remind everybody that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the only prophet in the entire Quran that Allah Ta'ala never addresses him directly with his name, right? He just mentions him. If he wants to mention him, it's mentioned, I think, roughly in four places in the Quran by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those four places, Allah Ta'ala does for specific reasons. I don't want to jump into it because then I'm going to like spoil the story. That's a very nice place Allah brings it in the surah. I don't want to do that. Rather, we want to talk about why did Allah Ta'ala call him by his, his title and respect, okay? Allah Ta'ala is about to address his prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Ta'ala addresses him in the highest forms. And remember, the Quran is a book of guidance for you and me. So when Allah Ta'ala says, I don't take the name of my Nabi, should you take the name of his Nabi? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is the tragedy of our Ummah. Unfortunately, first and foremost, the first lesson we're deriving here is Allah is teaching us that this Ummah, if you want to develop this Ummah, societally, culturally, wherever you're going, it must be built on respect and adab. And adab is the first lesson of Islam. You are not a person of true Muslim. You're not a true Muslim until your respect, Alhamdulillah, shows what your Islam has inside. And this is unfortunate where we suffer so much. You know, subhanAllah. The title of the Prophet Sallallahu again is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We never even were so shy to mention the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever, right? SubhanAllah. Except for a few places in the Quran like I mentioned before. So having said that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is given this title because of the fact that he receives Quran, he receives revelation from Allah Ta'ala. So now what we learn from Allah Ta'ala is that anyone who learns what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam learned, or anyone who memorizes what the Prophet had also deserves respect as well. So, for example, the Hafiz of the Quran, he might be younger than us. For example, we have many Hafiz in our community. But I, they, to the life of me, everyone knows, Alhamdulillah, I still call them Hafiz. For example, Hafiz Mujtaba, mashallah. I wouldn't call them just without their title because they earned that title. They earned that title because they're learning what the Prophet learned. I we respect them because why? Because we respect the Prophet. If you love what the Prophet has, then you'll love these people as well. That's why we respect the ulama. We call them by Molana, Hazrat, Mufti Sab, right? Because why? Because they earned what the prophet, they learned what the Prophet had as well. You know, such a tragedy of our ummah. You know, the sad part is this, right? We talk about respect and people like as if it like completely blows our mind, like, oh, what are you talking about respect and deen and things like that? Like, Allah forgive. You know, to the point that we have many times, many sisters will come to me, like, brother, brother Shaquille. I'm just like, <laughs> like, and you know me, I've been here for some time. I don't really care about titles, etc. But the thing is that, like, brother. Like, you're coming to ask a question about deen, right? There are many brothers out there. You know, you don't have to come to this brother. There are many brothers you can go to, right? 
I did study for six years. I did learn Islam. I did learn fatawa, et cetera, whatever work we needed to do to teach the ummah. You know, we have a title. Do you ever go to your doctor and be like, hey, brother, doctor, or brother, sir, brother, Jacob? No, no, you call him by his the doctor, right? Because why? Because he has a title. He has a certain level, right? Even if they're younger than you, the, the Quran made them bigger. Even though they're younger than you, the Quran made them bigger. And so they deserve and they earn that title for themselves. I remember someone coming to Hazrat Mufti Numan, subhanAllah. He's been working in the field of fatwa for 30 plus years now. Someone coming to say, Brother Numan. <laughs> I was like, I was about to have a heart attack. You know, Hazrat Mufti Ramin Sab used to tell us too. Hazrat used to tell us when we were in like second year of Alim course or third year. Because we used to come to him and say, Mufti Sab, Mufti Sab, Mufti Sab. And Hazrat used to say like, after some time, he sat us down. He's like, hey, are you my classmate? Are you my contemporary? Are you like working on the same level as me? And we're like, no, Hazrat. He said, hey, no Mufti Sab. We said, no Mufti Sab. He said, then don't call me Mufti Sab. That's what my, my friends call me, right? Because I call my own classmate Mufti Burhan. Although we graduated and everything, he's Mufti Burhan now. Same thing, Hazrat is Mufti Ruh Lamin, right? But we just call him Hazrat. We don't even take Hazrat's name. So the, for now, subhanAllah, since like I think fifth year of Alim course, I couldn't even look up past Hazrat's show, knees because of the respect I had for Hazrat, you know? This is the level and things that we learn in deen. You know, subhanAllah, the level and adab we have for the Quran. Can you imagine this, subhanAllah? This ummah, mashallah, can't even see the Quran on the ground. Allah Akbar, you've done such like an atrocity putting on the, on the ground, right? It happened to my Sheikh, Sheikh Tamim Sab. He was making tawaf in Umrah. And then he saw one brother he's sitting like this. And I don't want to do this. I just want to show what he did. His feet straight out and the Quran right on his feet like this, right? And then a Sheikh, he spoke to the brother. He said, he said Ya Akhi, irfa'il al-Quran. Lift the Quran. He said, Limada mad dalil? He said, why? Where's the dalil? And then uh, this is, if anyone ever knocks you on this about a respect in adab, Allah says, whoever respects and honors the signs of Allah, then that is from the taqwa of the heart. He said, He says, there's no taqwa for a person who does not honor the signs of Allah. Ta'ala. He told him again, the guy was looking at him like, oh my God, this he's talking Arabic. Like, having Ajib, la ilaha illallah. This is the thing, subhanAllah, Sayyiduna Ikrima radiallahu anhu. Sahabi of the Prophet used to lift the Quran, to bring it up to his uh, forehead, put it here, kiss it, and say, This is Kitabu Rabbi. This is the Kitab of my Allah. This is what we learn, subhanAllah. Ad adab and decorum, etiquettes. And if we don't know, it's because we didn't study our books. Imam Nawi in his chapter, he has a full chapter about just having etiquette for the Quran. Adab and decorum, mashallah. You'll get a lot just for respecting things. They mentioned about Bishar al Hafi, he was someone who used to be. A person who was, he was extremely religious. He was one of the greatest of the saints of this ummah, one of the awliya of this ummah. But before he was Bishr al-Hafi, he was a person who used to drink, be in parties and music, etc. And one day he found someone who dropped a, a, a paper on the ground, which said, Bismillah rahman rahim He said, no, no, this is not right. So when he picked it up, he put it up to the shelf. They said, at that moment, Allah gave him hidayah, saying that he respected my name. So now I'll make him respected across the dunya. This is why, mashallah, our ummah has always had this. You know the Uthmani Empire, the Ottoman Empire? When they were building the Masjid Nabawi, right, to build it to a higher level, they made sure for the engineers that they chose were not normal engineers. They said that we will raise one generation of engineers and make their children to Hufaz. Once they all become Hafiz of the Quran, we'll make them into engineers so that those who work on Masjid Nabawi will be, <laughs> will be Hafiz of the Quran and engineers as well. Because they said this is the level of respect that the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid deserves. And in order to do the huge construction work, they wouldn't do it near Masjid Nabawi because they did not want to harm the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi sleeping in the grave. This is the ummah that we have. And people are trying to remove this honor and respect. La ilaha illallah. We have to have decorum. You're, honor, you're an honored society as long as you respect one another. And we have to think about it whenever Muslim brothers come in, everyone is a beloved, respected person before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So may Allah grant us tawfiq inshallah. This, I haven't even gone past Yayu and Nabi yet. Okay, okay, Yayu and Nabi. So what did Allah tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Ittaqillah, fear Allah, be mindful of Allah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, be mindful of Allah Ta'ala. How could that be? Everyone, does everyone agree? The Prophet already has the highest level of taqwa. So what is Allah Ta'ala telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is the idea that when you are a leader, you cannot, as a leader, you cannot tell your followers to do something unless you're doing it yourself. And this is the thing. We often want to lead without example. La ilaha illallah, this is not how dunya works ever. Everything you need, someone who's done it before, through experience you learn from them, subhanAllah. Even if you learn the manual, you still have to find someone who educates you about how to use the manual. 
So what happens is if you're imam, a hafiz, etc., you know, it pains my heart, subhanAllah. Like you, we want everyone to come to Fajr. I do, you know, alhamdulillah. It's always my dua for everybody. Allah make it easy for all of us, inshallah. Well, alhamdulillah, masjid has improved a lot. May Allah take accept, mashallah. Allow us to increase, inshallah ta'ala. But if I'm not coming, I really, it's embarrassing then. I, this guy's not coming himself. You know, alhamdulillah, this hafiz, you're know, telling me this, but this hafiz is not coming. Everyone needs to show that, look, I learned deen and now I need to come. Same thing being a mother and father. You can't expect your children to learn unless you show them through practice and example. If they see yourself, inshallah, doing the deen, they also want to practice deen. This is what we're learning first in this first word. Be mindful of Allah, Prophet If you're mindful of Allah, your ummah will be mindful of Allah Ta'ala. Similarly, what we learned from this as well is that Allah Ta'ala signed the Prophet very deeply that this is not the end, O Prophet What level you're on, can anyone truly have true taqwa of Allah? Does anyone know who, how great Allah Ta'ala really is? No one could ever know that. So the Prophet is being told by Allah Ta'ala, O Prophet of Islam, Continue to increase yourself because there's no end to how high you can get before me. You can continue to increase. Many times we come into the month of Ramadan, we think we've already hit our limit. Nothing more I can do. Listen, man, just, just make niya. You know, subhanAllah, someone told me yesterday that I wanted the lights off and I just was talking to a brother. Alhamdulillah, Allah just turned the light off. I said, subhanAllah. Right? And this is it clicked in my mind. If you want something from Allah, Allah will give it to you. And this is the thing. You just have to make niya. Many of us have already put a limiter on our brain. I can only read this much Quran. I can only do this much zikr. I can only sign for Nusra Tarawi. Allah Ta'ala has no limits, brothers and sisters. Make another intention. Tell yourself, Allah, I want to hit like three khatams or five khatams. I know it sounds impossible, but you'll never see, you'll never imagine how Allah Ta'ala will fulfill it for you. Things will happen in ways you can never even imagine. So Allah Ta'ala tells the Prophet, وسلم, be mindful of Allah, increase yourself, of Prophet, وسلم, be, a, be a, a lesson and uh, an advice for your ummah so they know exactly what to do. Allah Ta'ala says, be mindful. Ya ala al-khala'iq. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Same thing. Wa la tuti'il kafirina wal Do not follow the kafir. And do not follow the munafiq. What is a kafir? A disbeliever is someone, linguistically, it's someone who's covered something. They use it for a farmer who's covered dirt on something. That's what a kafir is, right? He covers dirt on a seed. A seed is a blessing. What he does is he puts dirt over it, pretends like, as if it's not there anymore. A kafir in Islam, a uh, kafir by understanding is what? Is that a person who gets blessings from Allah, but does not value the blessings or appreciate the blessing the way it's supposed to be. We unfortunately suffer from that. Sometimes we're very ungrateful to Allah, protect us from that. We have to be grateful to Allah Ta'ala. I'll remind you during iftar time, when the food comes, we haven't eaten all day. Alhamdulillah, Allah is going to let us eat. Alhamdulillah, you know? So we should inshallah be grateful to Allah Ta'ala. That's number one. Number two is a munafiq is someone who in Arabic is used for something which is hollow inside. You use it for like a tree that has no substance inside. It's completely bored out. And so well, you can just like literally like push it over and completely fall over. So fake. The kafir is fake and the munafiq is fake. Allah says, do not obey the kafir who's your outside enemy, outside of Islam. And do not obey the munafiq which is inside of Islam. Because what does a munafiq do? What does a hypocrite do? He pretends like a Muslim outside. Inside he's not a Muslim at all. And so what does he do? He tries to corrupt your faith from inside. The Prophet is being told by Allah Ta'ala that look, O Prophet of Allah, be mindful of me. Do not obey the disbeliever and do not obey the hypocrite. Okay, and now why is this important? Because how do you show your taqwa? Does anyone know? We said be mindful, have taqwa of Allah. How can a person show taqwa? How does a person show courage? How does a person show he's brave? How does he show he's generous? Right? So the way you show these things, any characteristic you want to show, you have to be put through a trial. This is the thing. Once you're put through a trial, then we know if you actually have the characteristic or not. For example, one guy, he... He says he's brave and strong. He just beats up on little kids all day. He just punches a little kid and a little kid. You're like, that's, that's not brave. Like, let me put you against a guy who weighs like 300 pounds and like a huge guy, you know, he's been in the boxing ring, whatever, heavyweight type of guy, right? And then we see you fight him. Then what we're going to say, this is a brave guy. Let's put you against a lion and see if you're brave. A person says they're generous. Okay, let's see. When it, the time comes to give, do you actually give or not? How do you know you have taqwa or not? When people are telling you to disobey Allah, at that moment, you tell yourself, I will not disobey Allah. This is when you know you have taqwa. Now, obviously, mashallah, in this time, we're sitting in the masjid of Allah Ta'ala. I don't think anyone's thinking about any guna or any sin to do. But you're sitting here. It's not hard, right? It's easy to sit here. The fact is that when you go back home, and now your family member is telling you to do something haram, and now you're getting pushed towards haram, the work is telling you to do haram, now show Allah Ta'ala you have taqwa. That's when it comes out. So the Prophet says, be told by Allah, O Prophet of Allah, be mindful of Allah. When the kafir and the munafiq tell you to disobey me, show the taqwa to the people for everyone, okay? This is why Ramadan is such a beautiful month, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that 
the whole day, uh, subhanAllah, you didn't even think about eating or drinking. Something we're just doing like yesterday. Isn't that amazing? You know, people say our religion is not about spirituality and stuff like that. I'm like, you have no idea how spiritual this ummah is. Two billion people were eating lunch yesterday and having meals throughout the day. At this moment, they're not having it anymore. If, if that's not a proof that Allah Ta'ala is there, I don't know what it is, subhanAllah. You know, Allah Akbar. Allah is so kareem. People imagine you wanted to go, if you want to go eat, what happens? You just tell yourself, no. That's what taqwa is, right? That you just tell yourself, no, Allah is watching me. I can't do it because Allah is there. So may Allah grant us that tawfiq, inshallah. Inna Allah kana bima aliman hakima. Allah says to follow him because he's all wise and all knowledgeable. Inshallah, that's the first ayah. Inshallah, we'll slowly get through it all, inshallah. But again, this is the depth of the Quran. One word can take you for literally for hours, mashallah. So may Allah grant us all tawfiq, inshallah. Allow us to benefit from what we've heard. Allow, to, allow, allow us to first and foremost get the respect that we need, inshallah ta'ala. Allow us to become people of muttaqeen, inshallah. Allow to allow us that we become people that we don't disobey Allah for every single, any moment of our life, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.